Tim, uh, you are the editor of the uh, poetry magazine Rattle. You are a poet, but you also write articles about writing. Mm -hmm. In one of the articles I read, you say that most poets, even the most talented, those more brilliant that I can never aspire to be, have little idea what they are actually doing or how <laughs> they do it. <laughs> so um, as a writer, do you know what you are doing <laughs> and how you do it? Well, um, I think you know that's one of the things I kind of, I like to analyze everything. That's kind of how I think. And so I kind of like to break down what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. but, but I do get the sense reading, you know, because in Rattle we publish a lot of interviews. I think it's, we're up to 72 or something. I've read them all, even the ones before I was an editor. And um, I've been sitting through um, most of them too. And um, yeah, I get the sense that people are kind of fumbling for what they do, but there's no real, um, there's no sense that everybody is doing a kind of similar thing, I think. You know, they're all, everybody's, trying to get to a state where you can plunge your subconscious for some kind of deeper meaning. And everybody has a different kind of way of getting there. And, um, and everybody kind of knows their way. But there's kind of this sense that nobody really understands that it's all the same way, is kind of what I was getting at there, I think. And what is your way? Well, for me personally, and, and everybody might have a different way to that, what I do is um, I just find a phrase or some kind of, um, some kind of thing that has some kind of like linguistic or sonic sort of resonance for me. And I just write that out and try to pick up on that and keep going with it. And, and you get to a, a state where you're so focused on the sound of that little phrase that your conscious thought is, is you know, drops away and you're allowed to um, bring other things to the surface that you didn't know you were aware of, kind of. And I think, you know, that's my technique. But other people do it, you know, you can do it through writing formal poetry and focusing so much on the, um, the language, or you know, the, the metrics of the lines and things like that, that you, that you let your subconscious speak. Um, or you could do it. Um, I just interviewed um, for Rattle um, Ron Kirchy. You know, he goes to these places in his mind. He creates a whole structure of a whole town, and he like lives in the town. And that's how he's so distracted that he ends up pulling out these other thoughts and ideas that you know that are deeper than what's on the surface. And so I think everybody has a different way of um, of getting there. But that's what we're all seeking. Uh, when I was uh, gathering information about your uh, biography, even though you are very young, but you have uh, you have done many things, mm -hmm. and uh, it said that you started uh, with interest in chemistry, mm -hmm. and then you say something like um, the excitement of natural sciences evaporated. It <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. how was your um, how was your birth as a poet, or uh, tell us about your beginnings um, as a poet? Well, what happened for me? I really never. English was always my worst subject. I didn't like, I hated writing. And then um, in high school, at my senior year, I got cut from the baseball team. And it was like devastating, because I, you know, I, that's the thing I loved the most. Mm -hmm. And I ran home, like in the pouring rain, and I was like drenched and sad and crying, because I got cut from the baseball team when I was like 18, I was pathetic. And, <laughs> and I wrote, I had an assignment to write a poem for class that week. And so I wrote this poem, it's a horrible poem called Angry Cats, it's, it's really cheesy and you know, really tight, silly rhymes and stuff. But the way that it came out on its own, and that I was so absorbed for the hour that it was writing it or whatever, um, it was really, ins it was a place I wanted to be in again. And so I kept writing it from that point. Um, but I never thought I'd be a writer, you know, it's just something that, it was kind of like a fun hobby to do. And it was, it was fun to um, focus so intensely on something. Um, and then, I thought maybe, well, maybe I'll be uh, Michael Crichton and I'll, you know, because I, I love science. I love discovering the way things work. And um, so I thought, hey, maybe I'll write some science fiction novels on the side just for fun, but I'll really be a biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, so, um, and so in college, I, I took a few um, creative writing classes just on the side for fun because you needed electives in English. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, maybe I'll minor in English. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then over the years, this, the, uh, the science kind of got boring because you know, you know, once you understand like, wow, this stuff is made of little particles and, and there's nothing holding it together except the you know, nuclear force, you know, that's amazing. But then once you learn it, it, it becomes, you know, the, the higher up you get, the more, um, the more it's minutia kind of, you know, like the little tiny details aren't as interesting as the big grand things. And so I kind of got bored, I think. And I stopped going to my labs and... <laughs> 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 and eventually, I kind of had no choice but to become an English major. And then you ended up uh, being in a uh, in a writing program at, at USC for mm -hmm. your masters. Yeah, well, that was a long time later. I um, 
you know, after college, I worked just for a year as a counselor at a group home, and I ended up, by luck, landing this job at Rattle. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved out west, and um, after, I think, a year or two here, um, I went to USC part-time and, and uh, got a master's in professional writing, as they call it. Uh, even though it's true that, as you say, your interest in um, it's not, not natural science uh, evaporated, there is a lot of presence of science in your writing. Mm -hmm. In the book um, American Fractal that was published by Red Hand Press in 2009, I have seen a lot of uh, mm -hmm. poems that I yeah. call <laughs> science poems. Uh -huh. For example, <laughs> the one about the old mm -hmm. uh, mother uh, tarantula, which is, I assume, real mm -hmm. or factual yeah. information uh -huh. about the life of these uh, mm -hmm. animals. You also have one about cholesterol, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, another one that is called the uh, memory of uh, water, I mm -hmm. believe. Yeah. How do you see the, the, the presence of science in your oh, writing? Well, I, I really, I shouldn't have said that um, that's, that's, I got tired of science. It just got tired of, um, of lab work kind of things, the, the small science, the, the hard work of science. You know, I still subscribe to science magazines. That's what I like to read. Um, I'm fascinated by the actual results of the science, but then I realized once I was immersed in it that I don't have the patience to, to focus so much on a little drip of drip. <laughs> <laughs> so, but science is still shows up in your, in your, uh, mm -hmm. in your writing. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I would like uh, were you to read uh, this poem, uh, the, the Memory of, of Water. Oh, Let's sure. Here, here you are. I should say this, this study has since been pretty much discredited. But see, that's the thing. It doesn't matter. Like, if I was a scientist, I would have to care that uh -huh. this is probably not true. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't really matter. But as a poet, yeah, it matter. it's just yeah. the idea is cool, yeah. and that's all that matters, and that's what <laughs> I like. <laughs> so this is the memory of water. And it's actually, um, I wrote it about my wife, who was going back to college. Um, and she spent the summer with me and then tried to go back to college. Um, she wasn't my wife at the time, but we've been married since. This is the memory of water. It can be demonstrated with thermoluminescence. The salt solution retains knowledge of what it once held, though nature, though logic, would tell it otherwise. Dumb as a bedpan, the hydrogen bond remembers the lithium, the sodium chloride, no matter how long distilled. There is so little purity left in the world. Desire it, dilute it, strip it down till nothing remains. Onion eyes, wet, dry, last flake of the artichoke, bit clean, sour stalk, swallowed whole. The homeopath stirs his mug, glass rod guiding poison to bomb, bomb to poison, nothing settling, nothing dispelled. With every loss, the ache of a phantom limb he never believed in. Still he finds himself awake at night, clutching the cool insistence of a pillow to his chest. Thank you. One of the, the themes I have seen in uh, American Fractal is duplication or mm -hmm. duplicity and uh, multiplication or multiplicity. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you have a poem, it's called Micro Cassette, and you discover your voice and how you have many voices in your own voice. You talk about your father, your father dreams, other lives that he mm -hmm. could have had. Also in the title poem, American Fractal, you, you talk about mirrors and, uh, and the duplicity of, of mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I, and maybe this is completely crazy, but I have associated this multiplicity with the idea of identity mm -hmm. and also with the idea of American identity because the, the, mm -hmm. the title, yeah. American mm -hmm. Fractal. Mm -hmm. And also you quote um, Robert Frost, you say, America is hard to see. Uh, could you elaborate uh, on this uh, theme of multiplicity and identity? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the idea of the book is that there are different layers of our culture. There's the, there's the personal, there's the familial, and there's this global political culture. And, um, and the same patterns exist throughout each of those threads. Um, my relationship with like my mother, my father, is similar to my relationship of some segment of myself in a way. And it's similar to um, you know, our country's uh, military industrial complex's relationship with a foreign country. You know, those kind of r relationships or, or, or patterns that just weave similar threads throughout um, the entire fabric of our culture. Since the same, the same structures exist, um, the same psychological and, and philosophical and physiological structures, um, the same things repeat themselves. And you can see kind of certain, um, um, you know, certain tendencies, you know, they happen in, on this scale and they happen on this other bigger scale. And you can see the same patterns emerge. Mm -hmm. There is one point that I think is a good example of this uh, multiplicity is uh, called Calorie, is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind reading it? Oh, yeah, sure, that? sure. Well, this poem was written, I think it was even written at the group poem I was working at. Um, I was, it was a house full of schizophrenics and I was on the night shift. 
And so I was like the only one there at night, just in case of emergencies, basically. And everybody would, you know, I'd give them the meds when I got there. They'd all go to bed, and then if something, they woke up in the middle of the night with a bad dream, I'd be there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so one of our clients, I hate the word clients, but that's the word we use. We um, yeah, she um, she was always stealing um, silverware from. It was like a thing that she just did, um, you know, for wherever she'd go, a restaurant or the the uh, cafeteria place or the the kitchen, you know, anywhere she went, she would steal silverware. And so that turned into this poem, which um, you can see this manifesting itself in that way. Um, you know, this is really a kind of a metaphor for our militarism as a, as a culture. Cutlery for Kim. Everywhere I look, there's more of it. The silver steak knife in the sewing kit, the golden spoon bookmarking the yellow pages, ads for dry cleaning, tennis lessons, I lounge on steel tongs. I look in the mirror and a pair of forks have become my earrings, the ornate handles bounce against my neck. When the toilet won't flush, I find the bowl stuffed like a turkey with salad forks and soup spoons. The plunger won't work. I reach into the dirty water and pull. It takes both hands and all my weight to rip them out. I fall backward and it's raining cutlery, bare arms shielding my face from the tinny drizzle. I don't know where all this is coming from. It's like the house is sweating metal. Little shiny droplets of perspiration form in every shady crevice, every crack. It comes in all brands and shapes. So night a row in sterling fancy spoons, diner spoons, baby spoons, rubber linings, knives of infinite sizes, an array of forks bent with bizarre, unnameable purpose. Some of it is cheap, but a lot is expensive, I can tell. The junk I just tossed down the cellar steps, but the stuff worth saving, I hide under my bed. I hoard them until I have full sets, though I'd entertain 48 people. I have no idea. I haven't left the house for five years, so maybe it's revenge, I think. Maybe the walls are just sick of me, and this is all the defiance they're capable of. I stand on my coffee table and twirl, lying the plaster. Well, it's finally working, I say. You're driving me crazy, but the walls hold firm. At night, it's impossible to sleep. I roll over, and utensils clang, and the sheets, they poke at me through the pillowcase, and I'm pitching them to the floor. A blind woman in a sinking canoe, I heave and I heave until my arms ache, and there's so much to sort by sunrise. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about form. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, reading um, American Fractal, I, I saw poems that they have mm -hmm. more of a, I don't want to say like traditional form or mm -hmm. more standardized form. And mm -hmm. then other poems like this one on the page, it looks like fragmented mm -hmm. um, prose, po po uh, poetic prose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how does, uh, do you have a form in mind before you start writing the poem or it comes up to you as you develop? Mm -hmm. or? No, well, like I said before, I'm always following like an impulse of language of a certain a certain way of phrasing something that just appears in my head or, or I hear or something. And so the, the the sounds come first, and then I find the form later. And of course, a book um, that's about structure and form, I had to care a lot about form. You mm -hmm. know, it makes sense. So um, so there's you know, of course, there's sonnets and things, and, and those are patterns that are repeating through different sections of the book. And there are also those poems that are spread out, which actually those. Um, that was the form that took the longest to find because I had these poems that in my so head. The, the form of this poem? Yeah, the form of this poem, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I had the, the poem, they're all in my head as sound. And so how do you get that on the page in a way that works in the same way it works as the sound? And um, those kind of poems, I think there are four or five of them, are just kind of like freight trains. They just keep going um, mm -hmm. with no real punctuation and no, you know, you know every, there's sort of an organic grammar or punctuation to it but not a traditional one. And so having it be different, you know, regular forms, like a regular poem, didn't make sense at all. And I kept experimenting with different prose poems, but if you, like, had a big block, it would be too much space. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find a way to spread it out, and I had to find a way to let pauses in when you felt them as a reader. Um, so it took a long time to find this form, but finally I found this way where I would, um, every time there's kind of a slight pause at all in breath, even a, you know, a tiny mental pause, I would have a little, <laughs> just a, little a big space. And so there's that space there that lets you pause if you want to, but you don't have to. And um, the coolest thing, you know, um, I always had no idea how people would read that those kind of poems in their own heads. You know, that's how it like felt right to me. But I saw someone on some radio station read read um, the body, which is the first poem in the book. It's written yes. out of form, and they read it exactly how I was, you know, intended it. And they had no instructions, so that made me really happy. That's probably the best compliment I think of the whole book was just reading that poem right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Radel. You are the editor mm -hmm. of this uh, mm -hmm. um, literary magazine it's specialized in poetry. Mm -hmm. um, Radel was created in 1994, I believe. Mm -hmm. Or five. I'm actually, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> or five. And um, you became the assistant uh, mm -hmm. editor in 2004. You were mm -hmm. working for Estela Sully. Mm -hmm. And then you became the 
the main editor in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe Rad Radl? Uh, well, Radl was founded by Alan Fox, who's still a very huge part of it. He's the president of the foundation. He's the editor in chief, um, and you know he's a, a, a businessman who who liked poetry a lot and always wished he was a writer. And then I think at maybe 60 years old or so, he said, you know, I want to do this still. I, I put this all aside for my business. What am I going to do? And so he started taking classes, and um, with Jack Grapes, he um, he's a poet and actor, and he teaches classes out of uh, his house in L.A. Um, and he's been doing that for a long time. A lot of um, a lot of uh, actors and stuff uh, go into film from writing that program, um, those classes. But so Alan was in that program, and he and at the end of the year they make a chapbook, and he made a chapbook of the class's stuff, and that was the first issue of Rattle. And okay. he he kind of liked the uh, he liked the experience of it, and so kept it going. The problem was reading other magazines. He didn't see the kind of poetry that he wanted to read. He saw the you know the academic. Um, you know, the, the stuff that comes from the T.S. Eliot tradition kind of is what's being held up is, is what poetry should be, and it alienates most readers of poetry. You know, most people don't read poetry as adults, and he wanted to publish poetry that people could read as adults, and, and you know, not um, necessarily um, people who have an M MFA or a Ph.D. in, in mm -hmm. literature, um, but just regular people could pick it up and read it and, and take something from it, because poetry is really fundamental to, to um, humanity, you know. it's it's. It's in, ingrained in us, and uh, we're missing out, I think. And so Rattle is about, um, you know, having stuff that's accessible enough that everybody can un enjoy it, um, without, you know, without letting it be too simple and, and not meaningful. It's still supposed to be meaningful and it's supposed to be complicated, but in a way that can be understood <laughs> without a, a teacher there and footnotes and things like that. And one of the articles that I read, I think, is called "The Importance of Poetry," mm -hmm. and I think it was published in a blog. I don't know exactly mm -hmm. when. And you talk about um, um, the the why we write and how we write, mm -hmm. and you say something that I think is fascinating. You say the how is the science and the why is the <laughs> art, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, well, I think that um, that poetry is really a great thing to be a part of. You know, I think that um, I'm seeing the world in that that attention to detail and that that quietude and that um, the focus concentration. Um, it's something that's really lacking in our world of smartphones and, and constant connectivity and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think it's really the antidote to a lot of the things that are kind of ailing in our culture, you know? Um, um, just the, the and, and, and poetry, too, is about so much about empathy and about being somebody else. And, um, you know, when I read a poem, the, the poet is using me as the medium. You know, it's my voice or my internal voice. It's the medium of the poem. It's not the paper. It's what my you know, subvocalations are going on inside my neural anatomy. And, um, and that's kind of something that's really profound uh, when it comes to understanding other people. Um, and so I think that that aspect is really important. And I think just engaging the world and thinking about your own life in a deep way and what the meaning of it is, it's, it's really a spiritual kind of thing for me um, in, a, in a secular way. But, um, you know, it's, it's about making meaning out of this life that we have. And so many people... Um, you know, go through the day and don't really focus on that. And um, so I think the more people that we can get reading poetry and experiencing that kind of mental state, uh, the better we are. Uh, and I ask this question to many uh, mm -hmm. of our guests, and is if you see trends or movements in the contemporary poetry in America. Oh, man, that's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hard to say. Hard and to say I, but, um, <laughs> but, I mean, you're the, the, yeah. you the perfect person yeah, to Yeah, we, I see like 80,000 poems a year, so I see how <laughs> people are trying to get published anyway. And um, it's really hard to pick up trends. I see formalism coming back a little bit. Um, I, kind of a, the, I think the new formalism movement is picking up steam mm -hmm. with a lot more. How around. would you define uh, new formalism? Um, just, you know, just people um, you know, trying to take the old forms that have okay. been around for a long time and, and making them new. I mean, it's, okay. it's that simple. And, and, um, but there are a lot of, um, especially online message boards and places. We have an article um, on Rattle about, um, I think it's called Meritocracy. And it's by Colin Ward. And he just, he just loves the online poetry communities that, that um, the Able Muse has that erratos erratosphere uh, poetry uh, message board. And there are a bunch of other ones around. And people um, you know, really you know, focus on the fine details of form um, and they're coming up with interesting stuff, but then there's just there's just so much. It's such a huge world. I think more people are writing now than any time ever, and you know who knows what's going to be sticking. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a matter of like everything is happening right now, okay. and what's going to stick and what's going to be remembered in 50 years. I have no idea. 
Do you think the activity uh, in the online world has mm -hmm. uh, affected or modified uh, your uh, publication? I know they have uh, an online version, but the, mm -hmm. the, the magazine, how? Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just try to put the magazine on as many ways as I can. You know, we're not trying to make money with it. It's a nonprofit. Um, so I try to give it away as, in, in as many ways as we can. But poets tend to love books still, you know, so I'm not worried about, about you know, print going out of business at any time <laughs> because we love holding books, and, and I think we're going to keep doing that. Um, but there is this sort of the sense that, um, you know, if you look back at how things were kind of in L.A. before I was, well before I was here with the whole, you know, the Beyond Baroque and that kind of, you know, cultural subsection, um, I think it's so much easier now to have that in a global scale, you know. I mean, there's so many ways to be involved in the poetry community without leaving your uh, living room, of course. I mean, it's the same for every everything, you know, mm. and it's the way the internet affects everything. But so there's so much access to a poetry culture, um, and y there's so many ways to um, participate. You can, you know, leave comments and, and email and, and talk to people on the other side of the country who are fans of the same poetry <laughs> you are, and that makes it, so I think there's less of an emphasis on local, and, and it's just kind of a global poetry uh, world now. Um, and I think it, it might be hard to find things like Beyond Baroque be as important, um, because there doesn't need to be a local nexus as much anymore. There needs to be just a place where poets can go online and they can access it anywhere. I would like to, um, to end with uh, you reading uh, one of your poems, I think it's on page 72. Oh, sure. Um, if you want to say something about the poem. Sure. Uh, well, this is Pluots and Apriums. I wrote this when I um, first moved to California, and I had no idea what a Pluot or an Aprium was, so I had to ask the, you know, the produce guy at the grocery store. <laughs> and he said, Pluots are hybrids of plums and apricots, and Apriums are hybrids of apricots and plums, and it, somehow that made sense. So, um, so this poem um, isn't about that at all, but that's just a metaphor. Like the whole, <laughs> the whole book, you know, the, because these patterns repeat themselves, um, everything is a metaphor for everything else. You know, that's what a metaphor is, is a pattern that's repeated in a different object, and so you can use that object to explain the other, you know. So, um, so this is really about something else, but it's called Pluots and Apriums. What is missing isn't the sweetness, the succulence, Lord knows enough sucrose will render any object edible. Light falls across the wooden table, across the wooden bowl of fruit. The hand, the shadow of the hand, ring removed. What is touched must then be tasted. What is bred must then be named. Thank you, Tim. Oh, thank you. Thank you.